My name is Dr. Ross Michael Pink, and uh, I am an instructor in political science at Kwantlen Polytech University and the co-founder of Global Water Rights. The event tonight that is very kindly hosted by Kwantlen Polytech University and Science World highlights the most important human rights issue in the world today, and that is clean water and the issue of climate change, which is going to cause incredible devastation to the human population. There are 800 million people in the world that have no clean water. Global population is going to increase by 2 billion in the next 35 years. And we expect the number without clean water to increase to about 1.5 billion. Why does that matter to Canadians? Canadians are water rich because you're going to see climate change refugees in the hundreds of millions. You're going to see food insecurity. You're going to see drought episodes, you're going to see flooding episodes. All of this has an impact on Canada and our population. So it's very important that we understand these issues and try to do something in our own way to be a light for progress. And so that's why I think talking, educating, reaching out is very, very important. Hi everybody. Um, my name is Mila Kodik. I'm in the Community Engagement Department at Science World and I would like to welcome you to this evening's talk. Um, this is the second year of the KPU Science World uh, speaker series and Science World is just really happy to be a part of this partnership and um, there's been a bunch of great talks and we've um, really enjoyed hosting them at Science World. It's the first time it's being hosted here at KPU. Um, so enjoy yourselves and um, welcome. Thank you. And I'd like to introduce Diane Purvey. Hi everyone, thanks uh, for coming tonight. I'm um, the Dean of Arts at KPU. So on behalf of the university, I really want to welcome you to tonight's presentation and say a special thank you to Science World for their support and collaboration on the KPU Science World series project. Each of you received a survey tonight and at the bottom of the survey is um, a place for you to fill out your, your name. So after the presentation, if you could give us your uh, feedback on the presentation and then fill out the bottom of the survey and then drop it into a box which is right outside the door there, that would be great. The information really helps us to um, uh, make the uh, uh, series uh, even better than it already is. So tonight is the third installment of the uh, KPU Science World Speaker Series, and our tonight's speaker is uh, Dr. Ross Michael Pink. Uh, Dr. Pink is a political science professor at KPU and has taught courses on water rights and, hu and human security over the past 15 years. As co-founder of Global Water Rights, an educational NGO, he has been published numerous times, including the Harvard University Health and Human Rights Journal, Asian Affairs, an American Review, the Journal of the Institute of Asian Studies, and in 2015 wrote the book Water Rights in Southeast Asia and India. Dr. Pink was also a speaker and delegate at the UN Institute of Water, Environment, and Health Symposium recently held this past May. And Ross concluded a lecture series on water rights and climate change that took him through several uni universities and organizations throughout Asia, including Singapore, Myanmar, and Thailand. Without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Ross Michael Pink. Thank you very much, Diane. And uh, it's a real honor to be here and talk about water. Uh, one of my favorite topics. And also to give a real uh, thank you to Science World and of course KPU, both for showing leadership on this series and you know, educating. It's such an important idea to educate about all of these issues that are covered uh, with this uh, alliance and also of course about water. Let me just start by saying that uh, there's a quote, one of my favorite quotes by uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, a former first lady of the United States, uh, the, uh, the wife of FDR. And uh, Miss Roosevelt said that it's better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. And the reason that is such a powerful quote is because, you know, when we look around the world, and it's so great to see young people here as well, we look at a lot of problems, but we have to keep in mind what is our goal. Not to be dismayed, but to work on solutions. 
So tonight we're going to talk about some of the problems in the world, and they are big problems. Let's not kid ourselves. They're huge problems. However, there are a lot of bright solutions as well. And so to end the uh, presentation tonight on an uplifting and innovative note, we're going to talk about three of them. Uh, and those three are rainwater harvesting, cloud seeding, and desalinization. Now, I'm fortunate to be able to teach at Kwantlen, and uh, often in teaching political science and uh, sustainability, I like to tell my students, well, John F. Kennedy said back in the 60s that whoever figures out a way to make desalinization available to the masses will win a Nobel Prize. That was John F. Kennedy in the 1960s. So, with all due respect to President Kennedy, I've added to that and said to my students on many occasions, if you do this, not only will you likely and hopefully win a Nobel Prize, but you'll also become a billionaire in the process. So that's sort of a little bit of a motivation, but in a good way. So let's get into uh, the topic. We have some slides and some data to show you. I'm not going to dwell too much on any individual slide. Uh, and then we'll go to the solutions part. And the most enjoyable part of these presentations for myself is to hear what you have to say. It's really exciting and uh, interesting to hear your comments and your questions. So we'll certainly have ample time. Uh, I think we have 30, 35 minutes for that. Uh, let me just also say that uh, a KPU was generous to give a, what we call a PD grant. And as Diane mentioned, we, uh, we went to uh, Myanmar, formerly known as Burma and uh, uh, Thailand, and also to Singapore. Singapore is a world leader on uh, desalinization as well. So let's start out by showing you a little bit of the backgrounder. And uh, feel free, after we're finished, to uh, uh, give all your good questions uh, after we're done here. So, this is uh, well known, about 2% of global water is fresh. But the problem is that half of that water is not drinkable because it's polluted. Now think about this, we have about 7.1 billion people in the world today. By 2050, that's only 34 years from now, of course we'll all be still very young by that point, right? But only 34 years from now, they are projecting about 9.4 billion people on the planet. So water scarcity is actually going to increase. They say about 800 million people today have no clean water in their immediate environment. By 2050, that could be as high as 1.7 billion people. So it's, a, it's the biggest human rights crisis in the world is clean water. Uh, so we really need to pay attention to that issue. Now, water access is very much related to poverty issues. And there's a formula that we use in, in economics and politics called the 80-20 rule, where basically about 80% of global wealth is controlled by 20% of the population, primarily in the northern hemisphere. Now, Milton Friedman, as some of you may know, was a very well-known uh, economist, a right-wing economist. He won the Nobel Prize in economics. And uh, actually, I had the opportunity to interview Milton Friedman, oh, about at the Fraser Institute. Um, and uh, I couldn't resist asking him the question. Um, and by this point, he was about 83. And, you know, he advised presidents and many governments and so forth. And so I said, you know, Dr. Friedman, in your experience, what is the biggest economic crisis in the world today? So, you know, with a right-wing economist and, uh, you know, fetid by all these governments and think tanks and so forth, you might think he'd talk about Phillips curves, demand curves, you know, something like that. But he shocked me. He said, the, and Milton Friedman was a very emphatic person, you know, and he was very powerful in his opinions. He said, you know, the number one issue is the gap between the rich and the poor. And he said, this gap is going to widen enormously in the next 20 or 30 years. 
and going to lead to tremendous social conflict around the world. So here you have a right-wing economist making this comment, which just shows you the credibility of the issue as well, and we're seeing a lot more evidence of that, but it particularly applies to water, because one of the danger signs with respect to water is that we're seeing many governments around the world trying to privatize water. Well, if you're wealthy or upper middle class, it's not an issue. But if you're poor, and most of the people who are struggling with water security are living in developing countries, they can't afford even one dollar a week more for water. So what do they do? They don't do. They do without. So that's why I wanted to mention uh, this point of 80-20 rule and uh, the comment by uh, Milton Friedman. Now, the UN uh, has taken a leadership role in international law. And there's, uh, some of you may be familiar with the Convention on the Rights of the Child that was uh, processed, uh, formally adopted in 1989. And if you look at international law, many treaties actually talk about water, but they do so in an indirect way. One of my points is that we really need a treaty or a convention at the UN that specifically addresses water rights. So it's good to have water rights acknowledged in the Convention on the Rights of the Child uh, and the Declaration of uh, Human Rights, 1948, but we don't have a specific convention or treaty, and that's something that the world community really needs to address urgently uh, to help in this situation. Uh, a major step forward was in July of 2010 when the United Nations General Assembly formally adopted a resolution that said water is a human right. Now that may seem uh, obvious to a lot of people, but until the international community, particularly the United Nations, says water is a human right, it doesn't take, to use a legal term, full force and effect. So now that we've recognized at the UN, in the General Assembly, that water is a human right, what tends to happen is national governments and international NGOs and the UN and other departments focus much more on the issue of water rights. So that's a very positive step forward, having this uh, resolution at the UN. So let's just briefly review what are water rights. So there are several water rights. Uh, one of them, obviously, is we need water for life and survival. Uh, we, we should have a right to clean drinking water. We definitely need water for sanitation and health. The biggest burden for unclean water tends to be on children five years old and under, simply because uh, their immune systems aren't developed. I mean, they say that an immune system is not fully developed until you're about 19 or 20 years old. So a child living in poverty who also doesn't have clean water in their environment is exposed to chronic illness. And, and the cancer, I talked a little bit about this in my book that, that Diane mentioned. Chronic inflammation is now seen as a trigger of cancer. So chronic waterborne disease episodes create chronic inflammation in your body. And if those episodes continue year after year, particularly for a child who is poor in a developing country, that exposes that child to an even greater risk of obviously disease, but potentially cancer. So waterborne disease is one of the big issues. And, and if you look at um, one of the problems is that if you do get water and it's contaminated, well, you may, in many cases, eradicate the uh, parasites. But you need to boil the water to do that. And what if you don't have trees around you? What if you don't have gasoline? It's expensive. You know, the international poverty line definition is $1.25 a day. 
you know, over a billion and a half people are living on $1.25 a day or less. They don't have money for gasoline. They can't go and get some wood to burn. So what do they do? They keep ingesting contaminated water and get into this cycle of illness, contaminated water, and it goes around in circles. So we really have to pay attention to this issue um, about the right to water for uh, adequate standard of living and for health. Uh, we obviously need uh, to look at water as uh, food and nutrition and uh, for food production. Now this is interesting, uh, on average, you know, it, it changes for countries to country, but generally on average about 70% of global fresh water is devoted to irrigation and for agriculture. About 22% is dedicated for business industrial use. And then the rest, the other 8% are, is dedicated to, you know, home consumption and, and that. So if you're increasing your population, as we will, by 2 billion over the next 34 years, and we are contributing to more pollution, it just simply means uh, that we're going to have less and less water for more and more people. And that's something that we really have to deal with seriously. Uh, I don't want to get into the, the disease portion in too much detail, but, but basically, you know, there, there are common waterborne diseases like schizomiasis, and you've got uh, guinea worm, for example. People go into the water, and if they have any cut or abrasion, the guinea worm, which can be only about, uh, you know, five, ten millimeters long, it gets into their uh, bloodstream through a cut or abrasion, and then it can grow into the body. So, and actually, the Jimmy Carter Foundation uh, has done enormous work in Africa uh, trying to eradicate guinea worm, and, and they, in partnership with the World Health Organization and other groups, have made tremendous progress in the last 25 years. So there's a lot of serious uh, waterborne diseases that the world community has to deal with. So I thought it would be interesting to look at some case study countries. And what we can do is look at uh, India and uh, China, and then we'll look at uh, Thailand to kind of give you a comparable. Uh, interesting just to get a show of hands. How many people here have been to India? Oh, that's good. Maybe about a quarter of the room. And how about uh, China? Ah, good, good. And uh, how about Thailand? Okay, so this is a well-traveled audience here. It's good, okay. So let's start. Uh, my wife is actually from Goa. So uh, I'm very lucky because I get to sample all the Goan food. Uh, so it's, it's a real pleasure. Um, not to be too pessimistic, but the water picture for India is not very good. So, well, you can see the, the data there. 31% have no uh, adequate sanitation. But let, let me give you an example. So you look at the water tables underneath the Earth's surface. So think of uh, the, the ground. Think of the ground, like the grass out, outside of Kuala. That's the ground. So underneath the ground, you have what's called the water table. So about 45 years, 50 years ago, uh, the water table, the water level uh, in India was about, in general, 4,500 meters. So in other words, f up to here, 4,500 meters. Lots of water. Today, it's 1,400 meters. So it's gone down, 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 which means that farmers have to pump and pump that much more. 1,500 meter water table is flashing red light. It's critical. We're now at 1,400. This is dangerous. Uh, there are projections that about a third of the Indian population a lot of these studies use 2050 as a benchmark. So you'll forgive me for keep using that 
that date, 2050. But um, they say about a third of the Indian population will have no immediate water source within their village or town. And the water table is down to 1,400, but it will go down lower. It'll go down to, you know, 1,200. It'll go down to 1,100. So this is a big, big problem uh, that India is, is really already struggling with. And uh, what other issue India has to deal with is population. Now today, China is about 1.4 billion people. And uh, India is about 1.41. They're very close. Now, as you all know, the, in 1980, the Chinese government uh, instituted a one-child-per-family policy. Uh, you could never get away with that in India because it's a democracy and because of the cultural reasons, but they were able to do it in a communist, highly centralized, controlled state of, of China. But what it did, because the Chinese planners were very worried about population growth and its impact on economic and social development, so by doing that, what happened is China significantly slowed down their population growth. So if you go forward about, and just last year, China relaxed the one-child policy, but there's still conditions attached. So what, it, what does it mean? It means that by 2050, uh, China's population will only go up about 150 million people. However, India's population, which is around 1.4 billion today, will go up to 1.6 billion. And population projections done by the United Nations and the Economist and World Health Organization tend to be extremely accurate. So we, we don't, you know, whether you're on the left wing or the right wing is not really relevant. Most of the people accept the data. The data is pretty firm. So that increases the issue that's going to be facing India in terms of water security. Now this is a good example of, um, th there's a process called desertification where a lot of lands are becoming basically like desert conditions. Uh, Northern China is dealing with this issue over a hundred towns in northern China have been abandoned because they've turned into desert-like conditions. But this picture you can see is, is very common where people have to walk miles and miles for water and they don't have trees nearby because the trees have been stripped because of overuse of the wood. So you're getting a situation where a lot of the terrain uh, looks like this. Another issue that is very, very significant uh, is called uh, saltwater intrusion, at, which is also part of flooding. So what's happening in the world is that climate scientists know that a conservative estimate is that in another 35 years, the global sea level will rise one meter. Now, one meter doesn't sound like a lot but it is an enormous increase. And what it leads to is that coastal cities will experience devastating flooding. And what are the coastal cities most at risk? Surprisingly, Houston, Texas. I've, uh, I'm doing some research right now and, and I came across some data that I had to read twice because it shocked me. And this is data from NASA and the Pentagon and declassified reports from the Department of Defense in the United States. They're projecting that in about 35 years, half of Houston will be flooded and unlivable. Venice, the same. Other cities that are severely threatened by flooding and saltwater intrusion are Manila, uh, Calcutta, which is now called Kolkata in India, Bangkok, if you, as some of you have been to Bangkok, you know that it's a, a bit like the Venice of the East because it has uh, dozens and dozens of canals. Major flooding risk for Bangkok. Shanghai, major flooding risk for Shanghai. 
Bangladesh, uh, again, the projections are that, that maybe a third of Bangladesh, because Bangladesh is one of the lowest sea level countries in the world, will be underwater. And Bangladesh, as you know, is a, an impoverished developing country. And salt, as you know, is very corrosive. So when you get salt, you know, trillions of liters of salt water washing up on your shore like this, not only does it damage buildings, uh, it, it's a damage to human health, but it's devastating to soil because it's so corrosive, and it's devastating to crops like rice. I mean, you go around just outside of Bangkok and you see the rice fields. Thousands and thousands of acres of rice fields, they cannot sustain salt water intrusion. And rice is the main staple of the, uh, one of the main staples of the Thailand economy. So some pretty serious issues there to deal with. Now, I wanted to ben, spend a little bit of time, just draw your attention to the Tibet Plateau. Uh, as you probably know, Tibet uh, has been occupied by China um, since 1950. Now, there are three poles in the world. There's the North Pole and the South Pole, and the third pole is the Tibet Plateau. Uh, there's approximately 46,000 glaciers in the Tibet Plateau. Very mighty rivers flow from the Tibet Plateau. You can probably see the Ganges, the Mekong, the Irrawaddy, the Yangtze. Uh, these are major rivers that are sources for uh, over a billion people. Now, the problem with the Tibet Plateau is that the ice, scientists have discovered that the ice is melting at a faster rate than the ice melting ratio in the Antarctic and in the Arctic. So they're quite concerned about that because not only is the ice melting, but because the Tibet Plateau feeds several major rivers, like the Mekong, the, the worry is that these rivers will flood. And as they flood, that displaces millions of people. It affects livelihood, farmland. Uh, a lot of people live uh, particularly in the developing world along the banks of rivers. So it's a quite, quite a significant issue there. This is an interesting picture, uh, but you could see this picture also taken in many, many uh, developing countries in the world. The UN has done some very interesting studies on water carriers. And what they've discovered is that about 90% of water carrying is done by women and girls. So not only is it physically demanding, because each of those jugs of water could be 30 or 40 pounds. I mean, we all know how heavy it is when you carry two four-liter jugs of milk, one in each hand across, you know, 50 feet across the parking lot. It's heavy. So the average water carrier is going three to four miles, miles carrying something like that. The other issue with water carriers is that it can be dangerous for women because women and girls often go out early in the morning in groups, but they're often subject to physical violence and attack. So it is an important human rights issue. It's an important health issue. And the UN, of course, is focusing on this because they know that 90% of water carriers tend to be women in the developing world. Now, let's move over to China. So, China is a fascinating country to study in terms of water and sustainability because uh, northern China is going through severe drought episodes. And ironically, southern China is dealing with chronic flooding episodes. So you've got flooding and drought in the same country. The other problem is that as China has rushed forward with heavy industrialization, which, you know, you can't fault China because, you know, the Western world, you know, look at the uh, Industrial Revolution and so forth, uh, we're industrializing and using coal and chemicals 
you know, 100, 150 years before the Chinese. And the Chinese government often likes to say, well, you know, who are the Americans and who are the British to be lecturing us about the use of coal? Because they were doing it 100 years ago and nobody even raised a word about it. So, you know, there is a legitimate point that the Chinese leadership have made. But the fact remains that pollution is a severe problem in China. Uh, industrial pollution, chemicals, toxins are being dumped into rivers, streams, watersheds, wells at an alarming rate. And uh, it's become a severe health crisis for China. Now, fortunately, the Chinese government has begun to take steps to correct it. So, a major study was done by the World Bank commissioned by the Chinese government. And the study basically told the Chinese government that if they continued on the path of heavy pollution, yeah, it would cost the economy over a trillion dollars. And it would severely impact and slow down economic and social development. So sometimes the way we get through to people and make them listen is to make the connection between economic and social progress. You have to kind of touch upon both. So China, in the last five-year plan, have started to address pollution as an issue that's holding back social and economic development. The, other, the last point I wanted to mention about China is something called uh, uh, cancer villages. So you can see this water. I mean, there, there are scenes like that all over uh, China. Now, this book of mine that came out in January, Water Rights in Southeast Asia and India, has a chapter on China. So the idea was that each country chapter would have an expert to contribute an interview, and, and we were very fortunate to have that. So the gentleman, Dr. Tan Pao, contributed an interview for China, and he's a hugely respected uh, climate scientist, runs an NGO, does consulting work around the world. So we were talking by Skype, and he said, Ross, have you uh, been doing any work on the cancer villages? And I said, well, I've just, just thought I would mention it in my health section. He said, no, I have information that I will send you that is shocking. Well, I know in China, environmentalists are being put in jail. So I said to, to Dr. Pao, I said, they're not going to put you in jail for this, are you? And he said, no, I'm too big to touch. They won't touch me. So anyway, he, he emailed me these big, big files on the cancer village phenomenon in China. And it got into the book. There's a section in the book on cancer villages. Uh, just to summarize it quickly, what's been happening is for about 40 or 50 years, industries have been dumping chemicals, toxins, the worst kinds, into streams, rivers, lakes. And you see this small town here. So eventually that water gets subsumed into the groundwater. It gets into the soil. And then it gets into wells. And then about 20 years ago, medical doctors and scientists in China started to notice this exceptionally high cancer rate in China, in areas where you had heavy industrial pollution. So the researchers went to work making the correlations, and they found a positive correlation. And what they've also found is an extremely high rate of liver cancer and stomach cancer, which are attributable to this. And remember, we talked earlier about inflammation. Chronic inflammation is one of the triggers of cancer. Now, lung cancer is a different story, because that is related to the high percentage of the population, as it is in any country that, isn't, that does tobacco smoking. But liver and stomach cancers are being uh, positively correlated to chemical dumping in the water in, uh, in China. So that's the cancer uh, village phenomenon that, that we're seeing. Now, here's something else. The government of China has officially acknowledged 
460 cancer villages. But again, my friend Dr. Pantau was saying, we think the number is more like 2,000 or more. We don't really know how many. It's not like they're going to broadcast it on the nightly news. But, but people who are educated are saying that the figure could be over 2,000. But fortunately, you know, we don't want to be criticizing and condemning because that gets anybody nowhere. I mean, fortunately, the Chinese government is addressing the issue and trying to uh, move forward uh, with, with environmental cleanup. And that's a typical example, this picture here, of what you're going to see in many, many communities, particularly rural communities. Now, we'll talk a little bit about uh, Thailand. Uh, again, Thailand is a country that is battling both, similar to China, battling both drought, primarily in the north, and flooding in the south. Uh, even despite the, 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 the increasing flood risk in southern Thailand with climate change, global warming, historically Thailand has been subject to episodes of drought. And again, because Bangkok is such a low elevation city and it's the capital city and it has about 10 or 11 million people out of a population of 67 million so very high density in Bangkok. Uh, it's a good example of this tropical storm NOC 10 in 2011. Almost 14 million people were affected. This is just to show you the gravity and the severity of major climate crises that can hit a country. 14 million almost affected, 65 out of 77 provinces declared flood disaster zones, and 42% uh, of the Thai labor force in agriculture, uh, and they were, they were hit very hard by this because, you know, Thailand is a major rice producing country and also fruit and vegetables. Now, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but just to, just to revisit again, many, many cities, you know, not, not just the big ones, but the ones that are perhaps the most well-known, like Shanghai, Bangkok, Calcutta, Manila, all threatened by coastal flooding, including Houston, Texas, LA, New York. And I don't want to make you nervous, but Richmond is seriously uh, affected by future flooding as well. Uh, one of the students in my sustainability class is actually going to be looking into contingency plans by the city of Richmond for serious flood episodes. So that'll be very interesting to see the kind of research that they come up with. So if you want to get some good, reliable science that's actually quite readable, um, the Intergovernmental Panel on, Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, are highly respected scientific reports that are released every two or three years by the United Nations. And they, they talk about every aspect of water scarcity, water rights, climate change, the environment. And, but they do it actually in a quite a readable interesting way. So, you, and fortunately all of their documents are public access, so you can just Google away and you can even pick an issue and then you can pick a region, you can pick a country, so it gives you really good intel on some of these issues affecting uh, the world. Uh, that's a, uh, that during that tropical storm NOC 10 in Thailand, you can see how it impacted a small town. Now, let's uh, Let's turn over to the bright and innovative uh, aspects of this whole picture. So, cloud seeding is very interesting. It's one of the three solutions that I wanted to highlight tonight. Now, uh, it's true that you're injecting silver iodide into the cloud. Uh, what happens is the, the Ice crystals grow in the cloud, and then when they get too heavy, they break the cloud and they fall. And as they fall to the ground, I must be very careful when I talk here because our president, and I'm very honored to have our president, Alan Davis, here, is a PhD in chemistry. 
So I'm going to choose my words very carefully because Alan is the expert on chemistry. And, and, uh, but, but essentially, uh, as the ice crystals fall to the ground, they melt and then they turn into rain. Now, interesting, cloud seeding, uh, the king of Thailand, who is actually a very respected figure, and he was an egg, or is still alive, but he did a lot of his uh, graduate work on agricultural economics and development, and he's done a lot of good work in Thailand. And he patented technology on cloud seeding. Because the good thing about cloud seeding is that you can localize it to a very specific, like, 50-kilometer area. And when you have drought episodes in northern Thailand, it's been very, very effective. And in fact, the king of Thailand has a project called the Royal Rainmaking Project, which works with drought combating uh, in uh, various areas of northern Thailand. Uh, the, the king's uh, technology has been sold to China. A lot of people don't know this, but the Chinese government used, used cloud seeding before the 08 Olympics. And a lot of people who went to Beijing thought, you know what, I've been reading all these stories about the terrible air quality of uh, Beijing, but it's not so bad. Well, what they don't know is that like, they were doing 24-7 cloud seeding for like several months prior to the Olympics. Um, Australia has used cloud seeding because Australia is quite vulnerable to uh, drought. Now, your question is going to be, well, wait a minute here. Uh, you're putting silver iodide into the clouds. That's true. So it, I just checked. I, I like to check because I do a lot of talks like this, and I always check the latest intel. So the latest intel says there is no discernible negative impact from cloud seeding. That doesn't mean that there isn't a negative impact, but all I'm saying is that the science so far is saying there's no discernible negative impact uh, on crops, you know, vegetables, fruit, soil, and people. But I'm, I keep my eye on this one because I really, you know, if it's good, it's good. I mean, certainly the king of Thailand and the Thai government has been very committed to it. But we'll just have to wait and see. But so far, that's the, the scientific opinion. Um, and then Alan might take me to task after tonight for saying that, but we'll see. Uh, it's a very simple technology. You can see, uh, that's a better slide how it works. You know, you, you inject the cloud, the crystals fall, and then you create the, the localized rain. Uh, the gentleman, uh, in the center of the picture with the beige blazer and the camera around his uh, neck is the king of Thailand. Now, uh, I'm much more uh, fired up about desalinization. So, going back to our quote from John F. Kennedy. So, desalinization is very exciting. But the problem is, it's prohibitively expensive. Currently, 4% of the global population uses desalinized water. So you're talking about 280 million people are using desalinized water. Uh, the Saudi government has invested a lot. Um, the Singapore government is a, is a leader on desalinization. But developing countries cannot afford it. Uh, I mean, you look at, look at Laos, you know, the poorest country in Asia. They just turned the corner on combating and containing malaria. With global warming, warmer temperatures, the malaria incidence in Laos will severely spike. So just to give you an example, you know, poor countries cannot afford desalinization. But hopefully, like a lot of technology, as we know, with you know, increased production, supply and demand, economy of scale, and so forth, you tend to find the cost can come down quite significantly. So the hope is, and it will surely happen, where we can make desalinized water available to billions of people, and that could, could actually be a magic bullet uh, in our fight to maintain uh, or increase um, 
clean and safe water. So the process, uh, fancy term, reverse osmosis, but all it means is uh, imagine your bathtub uh, is salt water and then you have a little hole in the bathtub side and you have a filter in the side of the bathtub and then you push the water out the hole through a filter that screens out the salt and the other sediments. So that's basically what you're trying to do. And um, it, it works. I mean, desalinization is very effective, but the problem, as noted, is very expensive. The plants themselves, there's a good example, are, you know, they're 100, 200 million dollar enterprises. Very, very expensive. Now, my, um, I am so excited about rainwater harvesting. And, um, it, it's an ancient technology. It's not new. It's been practiced in ancient Greece, in ancient India, in, in China, in Arabia. And it's so simple and so cost effective that it will be now, not in 20 years, a solution. It's as simple as having a plastic pipe on your hut your roof, and you funnel that rainwater through the pipe, you can see the picture, down the, the drain pipe, and into a barrel. The, the, the only two requirements you need once you've got the water is a lid for the barrel because you want to prevent debris from getting into that water barrel. And, you know, groups like UN Water and, the, and, and NGOs can provide disinfectant tablets for literally like 10 cents a tablet, so very, very cheap. Uh, it's a very exciting opportunity that will literally save hundreds of millions of lives. Now, this picture, you know, gives you an example of how simple it is to set up. So, the Indian government, and we talked about this, is, is water critical right now. Well, the Ministry of Rural Development did a study. You can see it up there on the, uh, on the slide. They did a study, and they found that if 50% that of rainwater is captured, you could provide all domestic water needs in rural India. And you only need 1,000 millimeters of rainfall annually to be able to do that. So the, the Indian government and the Ministry of Rural Development have now launched a very ambitious program. Uh, for those of you that have been to rural India, that you know that it, starting with Ranjiv Gandhi, the son of Indira Gandhi, they started this national program called the Panchayat System. Panchayats are basically local development councils that operate in villages and towns across rural India. So you think of it like a United Way sort of a type of operation. So you've already got the infrastructure for social economic development system. So all you could do is add the water, rainwater harvesting component to the existing panchayat system and it would be quite seamless to get that off the ground. But the good news is that the Indian government and the Ministry of Rural Development are already committed to doing rainwater harvesting across all of rural India. So this is very, very exciting. Uh, now, Mr. Singh is... Uh, so the Stockholm Environment Institute is like the Super Bowl, the World Cup, whatever you want to call it, the Academy Award of NGOs on the environment. And um, we were very lucky because Mr. Singh gave an interview for our book on the India chapter. And then two months later, we found out that he won the, the Stockholm Water Prize, which people often call it the, the Nobel Prize of Water. So what Mr. Singh did is starting in 1985, with only a few dollars, he went up to Rajasthan in northern India and started working on projects to build uh, wells and clean well water for the people and also to start regenerating rivers that have been quite polluted. 
And for his good work, he uh, ended up winning the uh, Stockholm uh, Water Prize uh, last year. Uh, in its citation, the Stockholm Water Prize Committee said, quote, he has literally brought villages back to life. We need to take Mr. Singh's lessons and actions to heart if we are to achieve sustainable water use in our lifetime, end quote. So the Johad that they talk about here is basically a water storage tank. So his NGO has built 8,600 Johads, and um, they've regenerated seven rivers in Rajasthan since 1985, so quite remarkable. Uh, the other positive step forward, light, is um, Miss Katerina de Albuquerque was the very first United Nations Special Rapporteur on the right to safe drinking water and sanitation. So that's a big step forward because uh, uh, Katerina traveled around the world, she visited developing countries, she issued reports, and really helped to highlight this issue, uh, not only among governments and NGOs, but just to the general public as well. And uh, Dr. Leo Heller took over her position a year and a half ago, and he's from Brazil, and he's continuing. So hopefully we'll see this office you know, become now a permanent fixture of the United Nations. And there we are, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being such an attentive audience. So let's get into the really interesting part and turn it over to you for uh, questions, comments, and answers. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. That thank you for coming. Yeah. Um, you mentioned near the beginning that one of the biggest uses of water is agriculture. Yes. Do you see any changes to agriculture, any sort of technologies on the horizon that could significantly reduce that usage? Well, you know, I hope you don't mind staying here for another two hours because <laughs> uh, that's a great topic. You know, we're doing a course called Sustainability, and uh, we're getting into all these fascinating areas. For example, rooftop gardens uh, is exciting. I mean, yeah, agriculture is heavy water use, 70% on average. But there are exciting things you can do. So the rooftop garden. Uh, here's something really exciting. They started doing this in England. Um, it, it's vertical towers. So imagine, you know, we're surrounded by condo towers in, in Richmond and, and Burnaby, where I live. So imagine a condo tower, 10 stories high. But instead of condos, Every floor is a shell, but with vegetation and fruit and vegetables, it's hydroponic, and you use rainwater harvesting to bring you water. It's absolutely brilliant. You can use vertical farming, especially in areas of the world that, are, that, that don't have the density. They, they can't go out. Like, for example, what's going to happen with Bangladesh? They're going to lose, a, you know, I don't want to be pessimistic, but let's face it, they're going to lose a third of their land mass in 40, 50 years. Vertical farms are the answer for many, many situations. Uh, you know, the rooftop gardens, if you go down to the, uh, the waterfront hotel right across the street from the Pan Pacific, they have a huge rooftop garden, and uh, people are allowed to go there. They're donating excess uh, produce to the food banks. Uh, the other thing uh, is that a lot of people, as you know, are getting into either a vegan diet or a vegetarian diet. And of course, we now know, I mean, the, the, the science is pretty uh, concrete, that you can have a vegetarian diet and reduce your water use enormously. I mean, there's, there's all these stats out. I mean, one Big Mac. To, to actually make that Big Mac, when you think of the cow and the water and the feed and everything, one Big Mac, it, it's something like a thousand liters of water to make one Big Mac. Is that really sustainable? So one of the options that a lot of environmentalists are talking about is, is trying to pivot more toward a vegetarian diet. Or, you know, if you're really serious about it, you could go vegan. But there are a lot of exciting opportunities in terms of agriculture, you're right. Hi. Why can't countries that have a lot of water, or cities within countries that have a lot of fresh water, 
share it with cities that don't? It's a good question. I mean, you know that Canada is one of the top five water-rich nations in the world. You know, Norway, another one. I've sometimes wondered, you know, with the big pipeline debate in Canada, the oil. But, okay, let's get off oil for a moment. We know uh, drought is a serious growing issue in California, Nevada, New Mexico, right? Arizona. Could we not pipe some of our water to help out Arizona, Nevada, California? And similarly, um, in Asia, you know, we could pipe some water to drought prone areas. So you're, you're on the right track. A lot of uh, pr pragmatic people are starting to look at the sharing aspect of water because it is a resource that everybody needs to survive. And it just doesn't seem right that because you don't have any water you're going to starve or you're going to get sick. So I think you're going to see a lot more discussion on that exact point coming up. Hopefully we will. I think we have a microphone floating around here. I was just wondering if on um, locally yes. you have any comments because um, some um, Burnaby in different Coquitlam and different places are digging up the concrete um, from, you know, where we have lawn, where we used to have lawns. Yes. Instead of having so much pavement so that water can go through the grass and now planting more trees. Now, Richmond, we've got rid of about 70% of the trees in so many years. Really? 70%? The last, oh. last eight or nine years in Richmond. And we've paved a lot of Richmond. So now we don't have the runoff, you know, which contributes to flooding. But this concreting and getting rid of trees is only one of the aspects. I was just wondering what your comments were because it seems like this is multifactorial and we need more education and more. Yeah, you're, you're right. It, it's a multidimensional and it, it, it's part of the overall ecosystem. You know, when you, when you take it, that, that's interesting that they've taken out 70% of the trees. So that has an impact on moisture levels. And, and the ecosystem and the air quality. Because the more trees, bushes, flowers you have, the, generally the better your air quality is. And, and especially the fact that you've got, you know, how many jumbo jets a day pouring into Richmond or leaving? I mean, what would it be? Maybe somebody knows. Would it be 100 to 200 a day that are in and out? I mean, that's... No, I think this has come from the newspapers, and I might be wrong, and I might not be. Yeah. And um, so I wouldn't quote me. Like, because the builders have a thing where they have to put so many trees and, but, and they tend to, um, it's because of rapid building and cutting down the big trees and they get fined for it, but they come in the night and cut them down and don't mind the fine because the fine's not. Yeah, they're, they're, it, they're small compared to the opportunity cost yeah. of building and the profit, yeah. Well, you know, it, it, you're right. I mean, a lot of the solutions are local. Um, you know, people don't realize we have watersheds all over the Lower Mainland. And, um, you know, we don't really often think about it, but even when you wash your car, and, you, and somebody that uses soap and chemical, and then you see the big suds going down the, the, the street, well, they go into a drain, but people don't realize that goes into the watershed. All the salt we dump on the road, that's another, could we figure out a better way to salt roads that's not salt, something else? <laughs> because all that salt goes into the watershed. And it's the watershed, that, and it becomes eventually water that we drink. It's contaminants, chemicals, soap. Yeah. But I guess it's a, we're learning like how to reverse some of these trends. Well, you know, apparently we have um, somebody from the Richmond News here tonight, which is great. 
And that's something that uh, hopefully will get put into the story. Uh, because, you know, it really is, comes down to community involvement and, and activism. Uh, people need to get involved, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Just curious if you could speak a little bit about, you mentioned the, um, the local development councils that exist in India. If the Panchayat system. Yes, yes, if there's lessons that we could learn and think about, you know, and implement within our context, even though we're not necessarily the same level uh, or the same need for development, but what could we learn um, in terms of organizing and bringing important issues forward to the community? Well, you know, one of the issues with water is that it's become a bureaucracy. And the, the action time, when you get too bureaucratic, gets slower and slower. It's this inertia. But personally, I would like to see, you know, sort of water steward committees in, in each region. Like, not, not and by region, I mean town, and then maybe three or four in each city water steward committees that are responsible for the, not just water, but the whole picture of sustainability, because it's a circle. You know, water is part of the picture that goes along with restricting chemical or reducing chemical use, uh, air pollution. Um, you know, it's interesting that in, in Northern Europe, like in Denmark and Sweden and Finland, if you drive an electric vehicle, you get huge tax credit. And you also get free parking anywhere you go. And it seems to me that if you're going to be promoting sustainability in a green society, why don't we use that? The Canadian government has been, frankly, very poor about using tax credits and incentives to go green. Uh, when you compare our weak action to like the countries that are mentioned. So to answer your question, you know, I mean, I think the community development model that they've started in India in the 1980s, the Panchayat system, is a model that could be applicable in many territories and regions in Canada, United States, and other countries around the world. You know, in Thailand, they also did a, a remarkable program. Uh, they did a national rainwater jar program in the early 1980s. And the idea was that every household would have several water jars. And I'm not talking about households only in Bangkok or Chiang Mai. It was mainly geared toward small villages and towns. And over 25 million water jars were created. It was a phenomenal success that they used. It is a development model that's actually been written up by the UN and in many case studies. So, you know, if Thailand can do that, if India can do that, we certainly can do that as well. You know, people like to pat Canada on the back, and I guess we deserve a lot of credit, but we have been slammed by the United Nations for the treatment of our First Nations people. Uh, we have First Nations reserves in Canada that have been on a boil water advisory for 20 years. And I often ask my students, how many hours, forget about days, how many hours would the citizens of Burnaby, where I live, or Surrey, or Port Moody, tolerate having to boil their water? Probably about six before they were storming City Hall. And yet, you can Google it yourself, it's well documented, up to 20 years some of these communities have been on a boil water advisory. And uh, waterborne disease among First Nations communities is extremely high relative to non-First Nations communities. So there's a lot we in Canada can do. And, you know, Kwantlen Polytech University is truly a leader in sustainability. So there's a lot of opportunities, for example, for Kwantlen to be, to be working, as we are, with the community on sustainability and rainwater harvesting and other initiatives. But I, I like your question because I think there's... People often like to focus on a government, big government solution. But many times the solutions are local. Like there's a famous book I encourage you all to take a look at by E.F. Schumacher called Small is Beautiful. It's, a, it's about economic models that are small scale and community based. And this idea of the community council or water steward council, you know, it could really take off. 
Um, have, you, have you all heard of transition towns? Transition towns started in England, and it, it's a, its idea is a community that tried to move away from coal use and oil, and they have community gardens, they have rainwater harvesting, they have community sheds where you, you know, you put all your tools in the community shed and you just sign it out like a library. Because why do we all need a power drill? They, they did these studies that the average person uses their drill two times a year. So this is brilliant. Transition towns, and it started in, uh, uh, in England. And now there's like something like 4,000 transition towns around the world. Um, if you, if you uh, give me, um, I can give you my email, and I'm happy to shoot out some information. But, so th this is an example of community development that can be very, very brilliant and, and also very effective, right? Yeah, some, uh, uh, this gentleman over here, I think. Yeah. Hi there. Hi. Um, I'm just wondering about uh, sort of looking at sort of uh, more negative case scenarios, especially with extreme uh, climactic incidents in especially their equatorial band yeah. of the world. Um, I'm just wondering, that would seem to indicate that there would be, in the future, uh, increasing numbers of climate refugees, you know, where they either lose their land due to desert desertification or flooding or something else. And I'm wondering, what is our responsibility as you know, a country, among us others, that have a lot of land and a lot of water to these people who are yeah. potentially going to be displaced by these events? You must have read my mind because this, this is an issue that, that is really uh, so critical right now and, and frankly there's not a lot being talked about it. There are projections that we will see conservatively 300 million climate change refugees in the next three decades. Now. Not to pick on Europe, but the tragedy of Syria, you have six million people as refugees. Europe is slamming its doors shut over 700,000 Syrian refugees. They're saying, oh, we don't want refugees. We're backing away from our refugee open policy of decades. It's very sad. So my point is the world community is unlikely to be able to deal with a fraction of those people. And uh, it, it's very serious. And here's something else that's a big concern. You know, the COP21 conference in Paris in December, it was a milestone. Uh, at least the world community is talking about cutting back on carbon emissions. That's all good. China reached a big agreement to, uh, by 2030, severely cut back, all good. But here's the problem that directly relates to your question. COP21 in the final communique, not one word about climate change refugees. Why? Because they're, first of all, afraid to raise it. And secondly, they have no contingency plan in place to deal with it. And I think that's, although I'm salute COP21 and the member states. I'm very critical of COP21 for refusing to address the issue of climate change refugees because if the estimates are conservative, it's 300 million. But I've seen estimates in a lot of respected reports that say it could be as high as 500 million. So the world community has to deal with this issue. And by ignoring it in the final communique of COP21, that does nobody any good. That does a disservice to, to the, a huge issue in the world. So you're quite right. It, it's, it's a devastating issue. It's not going to go away. It's going to come. And it seems to be that the world community, at least as of now, the UN and many governments are basically ignoring it and walking away because they don't want to deal with it. I mean, look at, look at the projections, just, just to give you two. Go look at the projections for India and Thailand around climate change refugees. You're talking about over 100 million just for those two countries alone. Then add to that Bangladesh <coughs> and so on and so forth. And you can see the numbers start to swell enormously. 
we have to deal with this issue. And you know, you can't just say, well, it's, it's happening over there in that part of the world, because this is going to affect food prices, uh, refugee flows, uh, economic purchasing, health issues, global health. I mean, a virus can shoot around the world in no time. So, you know, we can't sit here in Canada and say, oh, well, we're isolated because we're, you know, 5,000 miles away. Uh, eventually, one way or another, it does come to Canada's shores. Let's be proactive. Let's be a world leader in dealing with this issue because whether, whether we like it or not, it's, it's going to come. Uh, and, you know, I'm frankly just reading some of the research that's coming out, and this is from NASA, the Pentagon, the Department of Defense, and the United Nations. It's frightening. These projections are absolutely frightening. Sorry. <laughs> but maybe this young man here will be doing something to save it all and help the world with clean water, right? That would be, that would be great if you could do that. So thanks for your question. I'm glad that you raised that. Yeah. So what can, so what can we as an average citizen do to help improve you know, access to clean water globally? I mean, globally or, or locally? Not locally, globally. Well, you know, there's, there's a lot of, um, I think, if you talk to people at the UN, one of the things that they keep emphasizing is education. They really believe in educating people, doing forums like tonight that Science World and KPU is hosting. They really believe a lot in educating to change attitudes and change the mindset. So that's what you could do on a local level. But globally, you know, there's a lot of very respected NGOs out there in the world. You know, for example, uh, you can put in a well in uh, Indonesia or Thailand or India for four to five thousand dollars. Then it'll function for 25 years. So there are a lot of, you know, initiatives that can be done at the local level, either working in a small group or you know, working with a larger NGO uh, group like uh, Greenpeace or the United Nations or UN Water and so forth. Yes. Thank you so Hi. much for sharing uh, the... Well, thank you for coming. Yes, the doom and gloom reality of uh, water scarcity. And yet, as you pointed out at the outset, that there is also hope. And um, I'm also wondering, just to draw the parallel, that similar um, scare was created about the food, uh, the grains in India, yes. that the population is growing and it will never be able to sustain the population because it will never be able to grow enough food. But the reality was just the opposite, that India became self-sustaining. They found ways, irrigation, etc. And so I'm hoping that uh, we create this awareness at the same time that we pin our hope in our innovative spirits that uh, it will not be such a doom and gloom prediction for sure 2050 that's it the world's gone but that there will be some uh, some powerful innovations will be coming our way so i would like to hear some hopeful stories as well well you know uh, mr singh who was profiled here is is a remarkable story uh, the um, Rainwater harvesting program that now has been launched by India is a tremendously bright spot. And uh, the, the, the rainwater jar program in Thailand, I mean, 25 million people got rain, and they, and they had like lo local craftspeople got jobs making these jars. So there are a lot of wonderful stories out there of people at the community, village, town level doing the initiatives. But we cannot be complacent because the numbers really are daunting. I mean, you're adding two billion people to the global population in 34 years. Sea levels, the, the conservative estimate, rise one meter. By 2070, all Arctic ice is gone. So you see, these are, and the problem with global warming is that these problems at this point in our history are increasing exponentially. So imagine it's like the snowball going downhill. It's going faster 
because of momentum and picking up more snow as it rolls down. These are very serious issues. Um, so the rainwater harvesting in India, the, the, the water jar program in Thailand, uh, and, and many of these initiatives are wonderful. We just have to keep, keep them coming. But we cannot be complacent about the facts because the facts are very daunting. And I encourage all of you to just take a, take a, a moment and Google the IPCC reports at the UN. It's all public domain. And you can read for yourself. And these reports are based on you know, over 150 eminent scientists. So um, you get a very clear picture of what's going on in the world. Okay. I think there's one more question, if we may. <laughs> you've been so patient. <laughs> About the international treaty, you've said that there is not there is not one international treaty about yes. water, and there's not many interests of uh, the countries to basically sign an international treaty. And oh, having these beautiful examples of communities working towards solutions of water, it ends up uh, that the bigger problems most of the times have to do with. The, the private um, interest of bottling water, selling yes. water, retaking water that's available and selling it to the same people, but in a bottled water, that uh, creates more garbage, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So I think what are your comments or um, thoughts of uh, to, in order to get to an international treaty and to put limits into the bigger companies and to maybe tap into some of the initiatives of sharing the, uh, the water that, are, that exists as of today. Yeah, you, and you know, you're absolutely right. Um, we, we desperately need a water treaties, a UN level convention. But let me just share something with you. Um, the BC government, you may or may not know, Nestle, Evian, whoever you are, you can buy Five, uh, two million liters of BC water. Does anybody have a five dollar bill? Five dollars. So I'm in Singapore at the National University of Singapore doing a talk and they're a world leader in, in sustainability and uh, uh, desalinization. And then in Myanmar, two different audiences and then in, uh, there were two or three different audiences in Thailand. And I like to ask them, I said, well, well you know, because they're, they're upset in these countries about privatization. It's a really big issue in these countries. So I would say, well, how much can you, 2 million liters in BC, how much? And they'd be like, oh, gee, you know, $500, $300, $1,000. And I, I, I was goading the audience, right? Keep coming, keep coming. And then I, I had a $5. Um, what I would do is I take out $5 equivalency in their currency. So in Singapore, it would be five Singapore dollars. And I would just slowly hold it up. You could hear the gasp in the audience. And they would say, are you telling me that in BC you sell two million liters of water for five dollars? And I said, yes. And they go, what's wrong with you people? And here's the other thing. Why do we let Nestle and others dump the bottles on us? Because it takes, according to uh, accurate projections, it takes at least a hundred years to decompose a plastic bottle of water. So not only do they rip off our water, but then they stick us with millions of plastic bottles if they're not recycled. I mean, I know a lot of it is recycled, which is good, but a lot of those bottles don't get recycled. They just get you know, put in the trash. So there's an example, and thank you for that comment, because we could make them pay more on a sustainability levy, perhaps, to help us all out. Thank you all very, very much. <laughs>